what may be seen as just a game is so much more under the surface. Countless stories reveal aspects of human nature that will forever be untold. And here on Philosophspiel, we will tell those stories. And we do mean we. This is Philosophspiel Video Game Philosophy. I am David Leibowitz. My name is Magic Day. I am Caitlin Ellison. I'm Alana. Time to get the spiel for your enlightenment. Game. Game. Stop. Start. All right, everyone, we are back, and this is Philosophspiel Season 2. I am here with Caitlin Ellison and Magic Day, and we are going to talk about a game I myself have not played, but I binged the anime in a week, basically. But these two lovely people have, in fact, played the game. Caitlin has even played Royal. Magic has just played Vanilla. But this game... It's going to be a long one, and it's going to be a fun one. Okay, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Sure, I guess I'll go first. Hi, I'm Caitlin Ellison. Uh, I'm a new member on the Philosophy Field crew. I provided the art for this episode, actually. Um, and uh, I'm a super big fan of video games, and I've always been interested in talking about philosophy, so I'm super excited to get to just sit down and have a conversation about stuff. Uh, I, 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 I can do introductions good. <laughs> Hello, my name is Magic Day, and I am also one of the discussion people here on the podcast talking about Persona 5. I've mainly played the main game, so that's all I know, but I'm willing to dive in and talk more about the game's topics as well, so let's start on that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so Magic, do you want to open up? All right, so... What's the first topic? The collective unconsciousness, was it? Yes. That's yeah. exactly what it is, yes. So, I guess the collective unconsciousness is supposed to be the minds or a collective universe created by human minds put together. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... And it also, it, it, it also kind of unclearly explains on how people are able to teleport in, into the collective unconsciousness. Because in P5... They call it mementos, and mm -hmm. the style is that of the Tokyo subway system. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, the collective unconsciousness is supposed to be a collection, basically, like a, a hive of all minds or of whatever people are thinking about put together. Usually, mm -hmm. it can be like happy thoughts or, or like, whatever people thinking of. It could be a bunch of rumors, gossip. Mm -hmm. trendy things people have in mind anything happens in that one unified space that one unified universe I guess created by sentient thoughts and yeah because yeah, okay, that's, that's where I clarify yeah, that's, um, just just before you clarify but yeah that's that's like the whole premise of mementos is like mementos is like a manifestation of like of the of the public's thoughts just put into one place and that's why it's filled with shadows everywhere and that's why it's manifested as the tokyo subway station because i mean that's where you spend a majority of your time going through transportation and stuff and that's where huge crowds gather so that's why mementos is <laughs> is the way that it is yeah like that it, it's like that and to match the theme of it which takes place in the tokyo city the tokyo underground they they've they've used that as their theme and it works pretty good Mm -hmm. But yeah, you were going to clarify, David? Yep, yeah, David. Time to clarify about everything. Okay. So, I think this is a good start, and so just in general, for any, or at least for P3, P4, and P5, but we're going to talk about P5, each of those three games have a collective unconscious. In P3, it's the Midnight Hour, and P4, it's the Midnight Channel, and P5, it is, in fact, Mementos in the mm -hmm. first one. Strikers, it changes it up. Um... But, in, P in P5, so, what it's doing in any game is the collective unconscious is 
for any psychodynamic idea. The, the collective unconscious is, well, starts with the unconscious. The unconscious is a psychological concept made by first Freud to say that basically all the thoughts that you are not thinking of right now, that, are, that you are storing away, are, that are repressed, are in your unconscious. There's just even, it's even lower in this than a subconscious. There's a way to think about the, the unconscious is that what's on the surface is is what you present yourself as. It's this iceberg. And then the sea, like in pursuing in my the song Persona 4, for Pursuing My True Self, they talk about the sea of the unconscious <laughs> and I going through the ocean. Like that's the ocean. Is the ocean is the collective unconscious of like and it and it, and it spreads out so far that it covers Every single human in the in existence, and that's why you can summon personas from all aspects of mythology, fiction, and history. Um, not just Japanese ones; they're from everywhere. It basically is. Jung was a giant hippie, and I'm going to explain how much Jung was a giant hippie and and woke. So he he basically talks about how we are all connected, which is connected to Buddhism, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay. So that is basically the collective unconscious. So in the context of mementos, it is, it is a subway. So I think you, you guys can talk about that a little better. But it's, and it base, and also, what mementos reveals itself to be as is, vi is specific to Japan. But the, this is the yeah the collective unconscious is just the the collective thoughts for people in Tokyo and how they're feeling. So that's why you can go and fight shadows. So a quick. A quick um, knockdown on that, and then we're going to go back to the discussion. For Jung, there are archetypes. And the aspects of the self, the whole self is is all of you. And that's connected to each other selves in the collective unconscious. The persona is how you present yourself as. And for specifically Jung, he speaks about in his autobiography about having the personality of, an, of both his young child when he was a child and an old man. I have not finished his autobiography, but I'm thinking the idea of the of the old man, this other self, is is is, is what he was getting at with the persona. So I am thou, thou art I. <laughs> and then the shadow is, of course, the dark parts of yourself that really is well in Persona 4, but in Persona 5, of course, you're fighting the shadows of other of other people that are that are their distorted <laughs> desires. So let's go back into discussion. So what do we feel about that? Uh, I think that explains it pretty well, you know? I mean, with the way that Mementos is represented in all of these shadows, it is very much the distorted desires of the people, and with the palaces as well, I mean, it's a manifestation of one's own cognition and their own twisted desires. Um, you know, for example, with, with Kamoshida's in particular, um, his is obviously about his, in, his insane lust and his own sort of god complex that he has about himself, and... I mean, it's different from mementos in that sense, but it's still sort of like these unconscious thoughts that are manifesting into like sort of like a, a, a subconscious reality that's within that person. It's within, it's it's a recurring theme that kind of ties back to the collective unconsciousness, but the collective unconsciousness in terms of mementos, I feel like with the subway system, I mean, that's how like the average working class citizen and how every student sort of travels and it's just sort of i'm like ah i'm trying to wrap my brain around this yeah yeah it's it's where people get together like even though they don't know who they are that's their not only their method commuting of transportation but they've used that method of commute to get everywhere and they all meet up in the subway mm -hmm. that's where you can basically find everybody there and i think that's the whole point of using that subway system as mementos because that's where everybody <laughs> is regardless of who they are and this is where and spoilers yeah that like, this is a giant spoilers discussion play or watch the anime or persona or or the game um before getting into this or if you're if you're down to just listen keep on listening it reveals itself to be a prison <laughs> And we're going to get to that. A lot of stuff I want to get to later. I want Caitlyn to get into character awakening. Oh, yes. But basically, yes, to Caitlyn, to character awakenings. But, yes. So, talk, but briefly, briefly, mm -hmm. when they talk about, in, I did watch the full Prison of Regression um, talk in the actual game. Mm -hmm. And in that, they talk about how the palace rulers are freed from that prison. They are, they are, they are, they are escaped inmates in the same way that the Phantom <laughs> Thieves are. But 
they are locked in, not locked, but they are trapped. They, no, they are the rulers of their own palaces. They, they're, because they are, each, each of them are people that are outside of Futaba. Um, you could say taking advantage of the rest of society, taking advantage of the people in <laughs> the prison. Why, why Futaba has a palace, I think you can get into, um, but, but I mean, even Futaba herself, even though she's not taking advantage of anyone in, because of her palace, she still launched Medjed, which is a hack to this group, which is, <laughs> screw, really screws over the Phantom Thieves, so, um, but in general, I think it's a good way to say it's like, these are the rulers of society that are screwing people mm -hmm. over. So, now let's go in, into that. Yeah, okay, so I guess then it's time for character awakenings. Yes, and then we're going to get back to Memento. Okay, play, sweet. Because there's a lot yeah, more yeah. to talk about. Um, so, I'm the one handling the discussion mainly on starting us off on Character Awakenings, because that was the one I really wanted to tackle. Uh, I wanted to tackle in particular how, like, first off, I want to tackle, like, just comparing and contrasting, like, the elements of, of Persona 5's Awakenings and the themes that are presented in the story to how they contrast compared to the, the previous Personas, Persona 3 and 4 in particular. Because I'm, unfortunately, I don't know too much about either one or two. I wish I knew more, but unfortunately I don't. I know about the most recent modern Personas. But I want to start off by talking about Persona 3's Awakenings, and then we'll work our way back up to Persona 5. But in, in Persona 3, a big theme of, of that was, was death, and basically acceptance of your own mortality and the cycle of life and how it goes, and it manifests in the form of of the Evoker, which is how Cease awakens their personas, and how any any Persona user in Persona 3 awakens their personas, because the Evoker is meant to be a symbol of death. It's meant to be... It's, it's supposed to reference suicide, because you literally take the gun to your head and you shoot it, and that's how you activate your persona. And... Uh, that's actually the reason why the protagonist of Persona 3 is able to activate it so easily, is because he doesn't... He doesn't fear death. He doesn't view it as scary. He's already accepted the fact that one day he will die, and it's easy for him to activate it. And that's why Yukari struggles to activate her persona initially, is because she is afraid of dying. She doesn't want to die. Even though she wants to protect everyone, she still has that fear that maybe her own life could be at risk, and that's just kind of how it goes with activating personas in Persona 3. Um, compare this to Persona 4, where Persona 4 is all about truth. It's about accepting the darkest parts of yourself that maybe you don't want to come to terms with. It's a major theme running throughout the course of the game. That's, like, all of the party members that you recruit, their major bosses in the game with their shadows being a manifestation of that. And that's why the shadows go berserk, because you're rejecting that part of yourself, and it's just further causing you more anguish and more pain, but when you accept that part of yourself, that awakens your persona because you are your own person, and you have created this, this mask, this other self, to help you push through that hardship. Um, you see it in characters like Kanji having to come to terms with his with his, his, um, his hobbies not being traditionally masculine, and him being criticized for him potentially being homosexual because of his habits. There's Naoto with her relationship with her gender because, because the profession she wanted to go into is incredibly sexist and they don't treat women the same way that they treat men in the police industry. And... Um, oh, I'm losing my train of thought here, but you get what I'm trying to say and then when I go to Persona 5, Persona 5's theme is about injustice, it's about individuality, and that's, and that's, and it's tearing off the mask that society has put on you. That's why the Awakenings in Persona 5, that's why they all have a common theme of tearing off your mask. And for all of the Phantom Thieves Awakenings, they all share that common theme, which is throwing away that mask and the pressure that society has placed on them, and they're just throwing caution to the wind and being like, I'm going to be my own self, I'm going to fight for what I believe in and stand up. Um, which is in the example of characters like Makoto, because Makoto has repeatedly had her morals uh, tested and she's had all this pressure placed on herself that she's, she's had these expectations built up and everybody's just sort of using her and it's built her own sense of morale and hasn't had the time to build her own sense of morality but when she faces Kaneshiro she finally realizes that you know that 
you know, this isn't the justice that she wants to fight for. This isn't the justice that her that her father wanted to fight for. And that's her reclaiming that sense of justice. And that's why um, Johanna, her persona says, please never lose sight of it again, because now she's found her sense of justice. Um, with Futavis, it's also very similar because she's been screwed over by by um, by basically every single adult in her life uh, because they had tricked her about her mother's death uh, and told her a lie, basically just being like, "Hey, your mother killed your mother killed herself because of the fact that you know you were you were such a burden to her studies when that was never the case, and because she was fed these lies." she lost sight of, of her own truth and when she she comes to terms and faces her shadow that's actually why she's not the boss of the palace because that's why Wakaba is actually the boss of her palace is because that's her facing the cognition and the trauma that she faced that was put upon by Shido and and his lackeys basically telling her that you know it was her fault that her mother died when in fact Spoiler alert, it wasn't Futaba's fault that, <laughs> that that Wakaba died. It was Akechi's fault that Wakaba died. Um, speaking of Akechi, <laughs> his awakening is very, very different compared to the others because he has the distinction of having two separate personas being exactly like the player character Joker. But why does he have two personas? Well, he has two personas because he has two separate appearances and it was meant to give the illusion of what is the real you? And that's why when Akechi says, I'll show you who I really am during his boss fight, that is Akechi's authentic self, you know? That's why his costume looks the way he does because it is just pure, un <laughs> like, unfiltered chaos just manifested into this into this character and his two his two separate outfits are meant to symbolize his public image and his private image and that's also why he has two personas not just because of the wild card but because of the symbolism of his character um the reason why he has this princely garb initially when he is first introduced as Crow and why he has Robin Hood is because that is who he was built up to be. That is his public reputation that was built upon not just by him, but by Shido and the organization that they work with. Um, to play with the whole conspiracy with the Elder Bales and, and stuff like that. But because he is the second coming of the Detective Prince, that's why he is viewed as this as this princely character, this idol. He holds himself in a very dignified way and he views himself in high esteem, but when he becomes the Black Mask, which is his true form, it becomes more ghastly, more, uh, like the edges become more jagged, you know, and Loki becomes a trickster, it's sort of like, it's a manifestation of his deception and of his insanity and his his lust for revenge and his, 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 his anger, you know, like, this is the real Akechi, that's actually, and I think that's really cool personally. Because it's like, you have, because it, it's sort of like, you know, you, you have two masks. You have one that you use in public when you're around other people, and then you have the one that you use when you're just alone. But, uh, that's just what, that's just, that, that's just, that's just my take on <laughs> the awakenings and how it all fits together. All right. Any comments on this? Um, yeah, Mark? well, because the awakenings... When they were making the game, I'm pretty sure they were th thinking to themselves, how it, how does it all match to whatever themes we're talking about? <laughs> and especially with like you, f you see it a lot more in 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 these games where whenever they deal with awakenings, <laughs> it's a matter of 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 how it fits to the theme. And yeah, Akechi does this, Futaba does this, Makoto does... Yeah, they, they all basically do this. Mm -hmm. I don't really have anything else to add on to that point. Just trying to think what else fits, but all so right. far nothing. Briefly, briefly, I do want to say something about a few of the Awakenings. Um, so, I guess to just go out through the rest of them, um, On is just as uh, a symbol of her beauty. Is, is the panther costume very... And why her persona is Carmen. <laughs> from, I believe, some Spanish opera. Um, who else do we get? We have, of course, um, 
my favorite Yusuke, who is the fox, the symbol of Japanese art, the, kits the kitsune. Mm -hmm. And 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 Goemon, the fame a famous Japanese painter, is um from 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 mythology, is is his persona. Very straightforward. But um Joker is 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 of course built up to be the wild card of the trickster, so that's why he is the Joker. He is he is the fool, which is sock loss. He is a he, he and that's why he's constantly referred to in the love room as trickster. So very basic again, Joker, not that much character to him, but more in the anime, but still, just good, good kid. Um, is there anyone else? Any other kid? Haru. Mm -hmm. So Haru, at least in the anime, I, you don't see her actually have her awakening. But then she, so, but then she, she kind of has two awakenings because she has her costume. You see her as Beauty Thief. You see her as Noir. But she doesn't call herself Noir until Milady um, gets awakened, mm -hmm. and that is, of course, her facing, like being able to, I, I guess, take, take on the fact that she is, um, take on the, the prim and properness, the beauty of her life, but not have it fettered with all of the corruption of her father. Because she intends to move on with her father's mm -hmm. business, or at least something similar to that. Something, but something nice and beautiful. How She says she likes to see, like, these, these soap operas and, and, and stuff, or Power Rangers mm -hmm. stuff online. So that's why she's so theatrical. That's why when she comes out, she has this whole speech that she forgets all the lines mm -hmm. to. Um, to add, to add further yeah, on to Haru, so the reason why Haru has her Phantom Thief outfit initially and why, while she does have a persona, it's not awakened to its full potential yet is because yes, Haru doesn't agree with the actions of her father and knows about her father's um, corrupt nature with the way that he runs his business. But she's conflicted in the fact that that's still her father and she still wants to try and have a good relationship with him. That's why she's very hesitant at first, because she just doesn't know what to do. Because she wants to rebel, she just doesn't have the full resolve in her to do so yet. And that moment where she finally awakens Melody to, you know, its full potential, that's her finally saying, you know, this is what I want. I can't deal with this anymore. I can't be a puppet to this anymore. I'm gonna stand up and be my own individual person. Yeah. And because this is not a royal discussion, we will um, we will ignore Kazumi until we actually talk about royal. And of course, so, we can't forget about Kazumi fans. Sorry, sorry, Kazumi fans, but we're gonna have a separate video on royal when that comes out. Um, yes. And we can't forget about Ryuji. Uh, Ryuji's awakening is interesting yes. in the fact that it's basically him just embracing the the image he was given as a delinquent. You know, that's it. That's why um, Captain Kid initially says. Um, in the in the awakening, you know, you know, since you've already been disgraced, why not race the, why, why not hoist the flag and wreak havoc? That's basically him just saying, you know what? I'm already seen as a delinquent. I'm already seen as some sort of you know gangster in the eyes of society. So you know what? Might as well play into that. It's Might basically well just that. Basically, it. like if I'm going to be labeled a criminal, so be it. I'm going to be the criminal and be your villain, essentially. I'm going to be the criminal. Yeah, I'm gonna be the I'm gonna be the villain of your story, but yeah, who gives a crap? You know, I know what I want. I know who I am, and nobody and and no one else's opinion matters. I think that's yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's basically, it, it's basically just them going, enough is enough. You know? I won't stand for this anymore. This has gone on for too long. The time has come. You're gonna get your comeuppance, and you're going to be brought to justice. I think that's done- I, th I think and that's I done think perfectly well, especially with the two awakenings for Kamoshidas, because these are- uh, uh, for uh, for those who have been abused by Kamoshida with Ryuji and on, because these were two people who were screwed over by Kamoshida, because Ryuji had his leg broken and now suffers a permanent limp from Kamoshida, attacking him in quote self defense, even though Ryuji was trying to stand up to him, basically abusing the track team. And with on, it was that she was forced to do these favors in order to keep Shiho on the volleyball team, and they both just finally broke free. And because they were tired of it, and they were. I know what I want, and you asked for them. this. Basically, that's that's kind of what a lot of these awakenings are: is that you've pushed them to the point where they've mm -hmm. become who they are now. 
if anything, like, the bad guys have asked for this. C- kind of. Mm-hmm. Wasn't the whole breaking point happened when she, Shiho right. basically attempted suicide and On realized that, about, well, not, not realized, she always knew, like On basically snapped as, as well at Kamoshida. Address. But we are going to talk all about this. why, in general, Persona 5 and Persona as a series was made in Japan. Now, I've discovered that there is, in fact, another game recently created called Jung's Labyrinth, so the West has made a Jung game, but. Persona, no one knows about Jung's Labyrinth. So, Persona, why is Persona made in Japan? Why did a bunch of Japanese people come together and say, let's make a game about a Swiss, a dead Swiss psychiatrist? So, this is why. In 1971 or something, early on in the mid 1900s, a Hayao Kawai became the, the first Jungian psychoanalyst in Japan. And he was very much influenced by Buddhism. Why was he influenced by Buddhism? There's a very specific reason why. Um, Because, as I said before, in the collective unconscious, we are all connected as a person. That's why Yaldabeo rules over all of us, and we must, and that's why we have to destroy him to to free free all ourselves. And for Jung, very, for Jung and Japan, Jung actually really likes the East. His, his actual, um, ideas come a lot from Taoism. I, that's what Hayao Kawai says in, in one of his lectures. I don't know exactly how, but I'm going to guess it's about opposites. But he also loves Buddhism. He also very much loves Buddhism. And he basically speaks about, in the spiritual power of the individual, about how the East does sort of have it all right. And the stuff that they say about the East, about how we all share this psychic energy, about these Mahatmas in the Tibetan monastery, he says... Basically, that I mean, I could pull up the quote, but basically saying, the East is inside all of us. Buddhism is inside all of us. We and therefore, Japan, China, um, South Korea, places with Buddhism, India, of course, but where India is right now, <laughs> we don't need to go with that. But places with Buddhism love that stuff, and J- Buddhism did go- get imported to Japan, not from India, but to- from China. So, in the spiritual problem of the individual. Basically, he speaks about how modernism is corrupting society, that people pay much more attention to scientific advancements than to, well, being your own self. And that basically, in the context of Persona, these these children are, are confronting the stagnation and cynicism of society, that especially in the context of Japan, that has been so inclusive, exclusive and so insulated, that they are fighting against and breaking themselves out of as thieves from a prison. And base and Jung basically wants society to go in a new direction. And it seems like it's not just east or west, it is combining the two. And that will be seen very well in their confrontation with the Odebeos. But I want I don't want to speak for too long, so I want to ask your guys on your thoughts and then we'll go into our discussion. Uh Magic, you can go first on that. I, I was going to say mostly that I think it's that there were a lot of Japanese people who really like Jung's work, so they thought Jung has brought up some cool points, let's bring that into the media. And I'm, I don't think Persona is the only media where they mention Jung or Freud or any form of psychology. I'm pretty sure there's types of media that they feed to the public about, hey, check out some cool things or some cool traditions a lot of people have worked on. <laughs> I'm certain. I'm certain. Um, South Korea, I did research. I, all I could find mainly about South Korea, if I probably went to Google Scholar, I'd find some South Korean Jungian articles. But there is a... But the, the K-pop band uh, group, BTS, made a song called Black Swan that allegedly um, deals with Jung. And I listened to... I, I looked at the... I watched it and saw the subtitles so I could see the translation. <laughs> and it does, in a very K-pop way, sort of talk about Jung. So I get it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if either of you two actually watch that, but either way, Asia likes you, and you likes Asia. Yeah, I think a big reason That's as to why in particular why Persona chose to tackle, it, why, pers- why like Japan likes you so much, is because of course they, they find they find his philosophy and his ideas thought-provoking, and I think that's why Persona chose to take elements from Jungian psychology and put it in there, because they wanted to explore Jung's ideas. Um, in a video game and bring that over to the media because 
Japan in particular still has a pretty big issue with, with you know, with favoring, you know, societal cohesion, you know, being as one compared to, you know, expressing one's own individuality. Um, and I think it's just, I think Persona 5 was like a, was like a perfect sort of uh, message for that. And it brought up a lot of questions, you know, to make people in Japan think. I think, I think that's why they like it so much is just because a lot of the ideas, you know, they're, and the way that Persona tackles it, it's very much sort of like reflective and it sort of encourages the players to just sort of look within themselves and, you know, ask themselves, you know, like, like what do I want? What do I take away from this? What does this say about, you know, society as a whole? And what does this say about me as a person living in this society? What do I do with this information now? It's important also that they discuss these things, especially at a young age, because they they ask themselves, like, how is it I want to live my life? Or how is it that I want to basically be a part of society that, that, that I know I'm going to be a part of basically for the rest of my life? And so what is it that I must do to improve myself? Am I going to, like, try making new friends? Am I going to set life goals? Because keep in mind, the huge majority of the Persona games have always been about making not just making friends but just generally socializing with other people and understanding people where they come from as well that's the whole point of co confidence mm -hmm. that you don't just level up by beating up enemies you level up by by joining a social gathering or lear learning about the people that you live with mm -hmm. i heard exactly and i think yeah. in general for for Persona, I'm sort of losing my train of thought, but it very much has, for Japanese society, as we're going go into the Japanese society, but it is very, it's very, it's very shy, it's very conformative, and for a game that, again, also uses, in from at least from P3 on, you sings majority of the songs in English, clearly a pandering to the West. Not only pandering, but a, probably a call to the West. The fact that the, that the songs are outside of the credits themes mm -hmm. are in English. Um, though, P5 Strikers got in, um, Towards the Dream got an English translation, with Lynn still. Lynn still singing it, but yeah, that's the first time they've done that, I think, apparently since Eternal Punishment. But I, again, we, we, none of us really know about Eternal Punishment, so that's P2. Yeah, I don't know too much about but either Eternal way. Punishment or Innocent Sin. Those are like the two, the, two, uh, the two games of Persona 2, because I think it's like a duology, if I remember correctly. I, I do know that, and I think, I don't know if it's Innocent Sin, but you get to get to play as um, a, a bunch of adults trying to re rescue, like, family members. I, I think that's what it is, but I could be completely wrong. Yeah, I don't know too, I don't know too much about the plot of Persona either 2 way, either. We'll have to look further into that. We're talking about P... That's why... There's a reason why P1 and P2 characters are not in Persona Q. So... Or in, or in Persona 4 Arena. Because they, they, they realized they got popular after 3, so... Yep. But people still... Definitely look those look at those for those games if, if you're interested, um, because again they're still using. <laughs> you. I'm certain they still using. I you, believe they still do. Shadows. Yes, but I don't know to the extent. It's called Persona for a reason because it's based off of you. Yeah. Yeah. The the topic and the psychology topics they use have not changed since probably the first game, but like. Every single majority of the fans here, yeah. we probably played. And I've only played Strikers. From Persona 4 was my all first to introduction right, to it because I found out about it a couple years back, and then I really started getting into it around Persona 5, and then I've just been like working my way backwards through the series. I, oh yeah, that's yeah. for me. It was P3. I've heard about P3 and its fantastic OSTU music, and after I've heard about P4 coming out, I tried P4, and that was basically my favorite Persona game of the whole series. As, as fantastic as 5 was, P4 will always be my favorite. Same here. And that and that's how I knew about the games. So, brief brief interlude before we get into discussion on actual philosophy. Not to say, again, that you, the ideas of psychodynamic are generally feel a little bit more philosophical, especially you. But, um, but we're going to talk about actual philosophy. And see, and see, and, and, and but before that, speaking of about if, if if Jung and Freud are in fact real, there's a book that came out on, was published on February 16th called The Hidden Spring, 
that I read the introduction to, started reading the first chapter, that is supposed to deal with if Freud, Freud's ideas are correct, and that, of course, anything with Freud has implications for Jung, Adler, all the other people, and people who call themselves Freudians call themselves Jungians. Because, again, a lot of different Lacan, a lot of different schools form from Freud. Some, some people just follow Freud, some people go in their own direction, because Jung is not focused as much. He says it in his memories of dreams and reflections, and as you can see, he's less focused on sex. Now, in his autobiography, there is some very much sexually stuff, especially when he's young, but his philosophy turns into much more than the woke hippie we're all together. So, let's take a departure from Jung and talk about what the Phantom Thieves are actually doing. And they are infiltrating people's autonomy, basically. So, do we all, do, are we all in agreement that what the Phantom Thieves did was right? Or does, yeah, let's start. Are we all in agreement that what the Phantom Thieves did was right? That's a pretty difficult. That, that's a pretty difficult question. I think there's a. I think there's a lot of questions about the morality that could be brought up, especially with the fact that you know, like, was this really the right way to change somebody's to change somebody's heart? Understanding the context or the circumstances, because mind you, a lot of gray areas or a lot of debatable actions or questionable actions that characters do whenever they whenever they do things to either save somebody's life or 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 defeat the bad guy and the whole morals and ethics come into play depending on the circumstances of one's actions the fan of thieves did what they had to do because like for example kamoshida was going to expel ryuji and the and joker had they and they had to basically break their way into his mind and 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 change and change his heart, or or another example. There's a whole bunch of examples. Or when Kaneshiro they broke into his palace and changed his heart so that so that they wouldn't fuck over Makoto and and also a group of teenagers. I think it's more about. I think they did what they had to do. Maybe what they've done was right, only because. Of, of the situation they were put in. But I... Absolutely. Yeah, I agree too. I think... I think that question probably could have been... Could have had a lot more interesting discussion around it if for the fact that these people weren't very obviously corrupt and doing terrible things. With Kamoshida, there's no question about it. Yeah, the Phantom Thieves did the right thing because he was literally abusing his power over kids because because he thought he was hot shit you know and and i mean he sexually harassed so many of his female students you know he he, he put he put ryuji's track team through physical abuse just because he didn't like the team oh yeah like like in, in the of course like the, you get to see that a lot of the things they do yeah like what they've done was literally standing up to injustice and actually calling them out on it of course that's a good thing mm -hmm. It's just their methods no. that are obviously, you know, put into question. And their methods the in particular, I don't... I don't think they're anything too immoral. Because, you know, they, they weren't trying... They weren't trying to murder these people. They were just simply trying to... They Which they are very important about. That is a very... It's, and that gets brought up again in P... Actually, I would say just briefly, in P5 Strikers. The whole... The whole methods came out because... They were granted. It's not like they chose their methods. It, it, they, yeah, they they chose to reawaken their personas and have the power, but they didn't get to choose on what specifically the rules of using that power was. They, it's not like they chose. Yeah, let's actually manipulate this person. They just had. They just had these powers after their awakening, and they thought to themselves, like, if if we try doing this, like, if we try doing these things. Mm -hmm some good will come of it, yeah. and that's kind of the what they've done. And the thing is, here's the thing, they keep on, they do say, like, again, the way, if, if you understand the way we're actually doing it, it makes sense. It may, it's, it's fine, because of the way we're actually doing it, because they have to steal the person, so they have to fight the shadow, steal the shit, steal the treasure, and they're very important. And it, briefly, I will say, in P5 Strikers, in the, for, for the first, like, that discussion happens again. Mm -hmm. That discussion does happen again. about, And they make very certain that they do not kill. They are Batman. They are Batman. <laughs> they do not kill. They just have. They have to do it this way. But to bring up the two, like the two main conflicting philosophies, is utilitarianism 
and Kantianism. And to explain both of them, especially Kantianism, is too hard, but... I mean, it's too hard to go, and we have a lot to I talk believe, about. So, I, I, but I believe I'm remembering in, what utilitarianism is, because we learned about it briefly in law class, but I completely forgot it. So yeah, catch me up to speed again. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give you the basics of, 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 of the basics, and just to just the most basic term. No, the most basic term, because I just want to say the why these two philosophies will disagree. These philosophies will disagree. Utilitarianism would say it's fine. Because you are allowed to use someone as a means to get a goal. You are allowed to, this is a misinterpretation, to push someone off, off the street, off, off, off into the rails to, to save five people. You are allowed to use them. It's just all about maximizing pleasure. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And what they did, what they did was maximize pleasure for a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, it's the greatest, oh, oh yes, Kant, yes, the greatest good for the greatest number. Now remember it. But Kant is a lot, one Kant went like they're lying. Kant wouldn't like the fact that they lie. He's very big about the lie. Two, you're still technically vi the question is you, you you're still violating someone's autonomy by changing their heart. Now, of course, maybe it, I, it's hard to go into, but it's generally about it's more than it's very more than just violating someone's dignity. You have to to make a Kantian um, thing, uh, an idea. You have to constantly reason to the fact that it's, if if this. If every like, and they bring this up again. If everyone had this power, would it be okay? They bring that up. Like, if every, but the, the, the see is, didn't, didn't they go into discussion or even discuss? Are we doing the right they thing? Do. Because we're, yeah, huh? they, they do that. Yeah, they, they've been literally questioning their actions of, hey, we've just manipulated someone's free will and took that away. Yeah, they're they're scum and they're criminals. They need to pay. But are we doing the right thing by extracting mm -hmm. away their, their free will and their freedom? And they they actually dove a lot yeah, into, that, into the game. Exactly. So you want to briefly talk about it? Yeah. And, and they and they clearly say, look at the targets we we attacked, because of course they get framed for murder and they get framed for mental shutdowns. But they constantly show that it's us. And this happens again. P5 strikers. They get framed again, or they don't get framed. But like other people, someone else is doing it, and they get framed because. The fan of these, they're the guys that can change people's hearts. I feel like I shouldn't be going to Strikers, but I just want to say, like, this is a this is a theme again that goes through. I'm certain we're not gonna speak about Royals because they don't have about Royals, but they get framed and shit. So um, But yeah. In general, I also want to discuss about um, I guess we can this was can frame into Japan issues, but the idea, especially in regards to Makoto, about how she believes how she wants to be a cop. Mm -hmm. And because she about what she about what is justice? Mm -hmm. What do you? I mean, like the idea. So, so I think we talked about what is justice. We just decided that what they did was fine. But any other thing again about about I guess um, the way the police are treated or stuff? Or do you want or like how 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 like okay? They literally say, they literally just there's a line in P5 Strikers like constantly like Haru says it two times like so confidently and so so nonchalantly we don't trust we don't work and trust with the police. So like. Any, any just thoughts on that? I mean, I guess that's more into the lines of some cops actually want to do good and, and do things by the books and have the seriousness to do their job, but then there's also like some corrupt cops who take advantage of some people. So I think that's where it all falls upon. Like, which, which authority do you trust or which one do you know you can depend on? And that's where Mak Makoto was saying that... Uh, and, and she was bringing up the idea that, yeah, like, you need to be careful about who you who you trust in. I, I was also going to say I don't know much about the Japanese <laughs> legal system or how law enforcement works there. So All right. I'd rather not talk much more about that because I don't have any I don't have anything else to yeah, bring I'm to not, the table for that. I topic. don't think I'm too, I'm, I don't think I'm really too knowledgeable on the Japanese police system, but I do know that it it works I think it definitely works vastly differently to that of of of, of the way that police uh, police systems work in in the Western society and even in even in places like Italy, you know, it works vastly different. You know, like they don't what like they're allowed to use to, to to not use like like typically like morally correct methods. Like they're they're allowed to you know pressure people into confessions and stuff like that. Uh, the reason I know more specific, more specifically about 
about Italian police is because of the case of Amanda Knox, because we had to study it in law class. Um, you know, like they they were forcing her into a confession of, of her murder, basically, even though she had no idea what was going on at the time. But in terms of the Japanese police system, uh, I don't think I'm really too confident to speak on that in particular, just because, I mean, I don't come from that country and I'm, and I'm not too knowledgeable on the way that the law system that how the law system works there. I'm not really going to delve too much into the Japanese legal system since I don't quite fully understand or or even know how it works there. So that's one <laughs> thing that I'm not have, we, really going to touch do upon research on other in the session. Um, and that's where we're, and that's where we're going to go into Japanese other topics about Japanese society. I want to talk briefly before we have what we scheduled. Um, in the case of Makoto, mm -hmm. Japanese society is a, is a is very conformity, very peer pressure. Mm -hmm. so, that is correct. Yes, Makoto, Makoto relates to everyone. Yes, there's everyone that wants to live up to their sister. or their, 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 really. But the fact is, Makoto has been manufactured. And she, by awakening her persona, riding her own path with Anyohana, is her going away from the very peer pressure society, very competitive. Mm -hmm. Like it's apparently, I was I've been told that it's that uh, there's a that it's the same thing as the Chinese. Like apparently there's a Japanese university exam and it's very hard. And and to get in and the only reason there you don't see Japanese students come to the West um, is because they're so closed off. So now on to bullying, which is also a big issue, in so, which um, Caitlin and Magic are going to talk about. Yeah. In, of course, in the case of Kamoshida. Mm, yeah. yeah. Bullying in Japan is... It's, it's something that it's not new to being explored, especially in terms of video games and media. I think a good example of how, of how toxic bullying can be um, is the series I watched recently called March Comes In Like a Lion, where you know, uh, where one of, where the best friend of one of the main characters, Hina, she gets bullied for being a good student and for basically sucking up to the teachers, and the bullying gets so bad to the point where she had to transfer schools, and because Hina was the only one who stood up for her and tried to say that this, that they were in the wrong, now the bullies have shifted their target and they start, they start treating, they start treating Hina like crap, you know, like they, they, they toss her shoes out, they, they rough her up, you know, they call her mean-spirited names, they try to provoke her intentionally, they write horrible things on her desk and on, on the chalkboard. And, you know, when people get bullied like this, like, it can, it can get worse from just them having to transfer schools. It can, it, it can, it has pushed people to the point of suicide, you know? It, it's a really, really bad issue. Mm -hmm. Bullying just doesn't end just because a victim leaves. Like, they're gonna find the next target and continue on that cycle mm -hmm. because that's what they do. And I think a big they're reason for why they, they, feel, they feel the need to do this is just because they have such a low opinion of themselves because that's kind of how Japanese society has kind of made people feel. It's like, you know, you're just kind of you're not really all that important, you know, you're only there to serve like a bigger cause, which is just to, which is just to work and, you know, make a living and not do the things that you love. You're just there to provide, you know, services for other people, because that's, that's a huge part of Japanese society is, is being, is, is like being a good host and providing good services, because if you don't provide the most important services, you know, then what's the point of your existence? And because of the way that the, the Japanese society works, I think that causes people to lash out. I think that causes these people who, you know, who are who are genuinely hardworking and good people to, you know, to just be toxic and, you know, flip their anger towards society outwards onto other people because they just can't stand the thought of somebody being more content than they are. They have to put others down to their level in order to lift themselves back up. I think that's, I, I, I think that's that's why Kamoshida did what he did is just because 
he's he's just so frustrated because he feels that he should be treated with more respect. So in order to do that, he, he, he tried to force others into submission. He tried to force others down beneath his foot because he just couldn't stand the thought of somebody having it better than him. He couldn't stand the thought of the track team succeeding. I think that's why in particular he targeted Ryuji is because he saw potential Ryuji in Ryuji and he wanted to destroy that potential and he wanted to ruin his life forever. Basically agreed that you'd think that Kamoshida would be proud that as a coach he trained his students to do really amazing things. Mm -hmm. But it's the fact that, oh my god, Kamoshida has been slaving his, his way and put his life's work on dedicating everything he's got to his school. That's why in his palace you see him as as the king of the school. That's that's mm -hmm. literally what he sees himself yep. because of all the service that he does. Yep. The f the fact that someone else it, it's exactly like it feels as if that someone's taking away Kamoshida's thunder and Kamoshida despises that. And yeah. that's why he does what he does because how dare someone else take away the prizes and possessions that I worked for or the things that I've worked to accomplish because you all people should worship me. Worship me. For I am the the, the one that actually brought true success and, and the true real worker that did so much for the school. Mm -hmm. All you guys wouldn't have come far without me. And that's what and that's why he's he's so toxic and despicable. And he did all these things to An and Ryuji. Because how dare An and Ryuji try and succeed without acknowledging who I am to begin with? Yeah, pretty much. All right. All right. So, um, I'm not going to speak too much about Hiryu Usai um, Madarame. Um, and we're not going to speak too much about Kaneshiro. I'm guessing Kaneshiro is a reference to the Yakuza. But I do want to... I guess for Madarame, the thing we could talk about is... Because Madarame is more towards Yusuke's yeah. backstory. But I think Madarame still falls in the case of over in the topic of like overworking, because I mean he 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 was basically forcing these these students that he was supposedly training to you know to to make more copies of the same artwork and use their works as his own because because it would make him the most money, because he recognized that these people had more talent than he did. So he wanted to, you know, carve them in, in that image, and he wanted to carve his image around other people's work because he just couldn't, because he didn't want to do things the honest way. He didn't want to be honest about his work. And that's why he saw so much, That that's why he used Yusuke in the first place, because, and, and that's why he let Yusuke's mother die is because, oh, you know, you seem like a really talented artist. So I'm going to not worry. So I'm going to just leave your mother to die. I'm going to take you in. Pretend that I'm being a caring person. But instead, I'm actually going to use you as a means, as a means of an end to achieve my goal, which is success. And have this image of of just a humble artist, but in fact, I'm this I'm this rich asshole who is just putting on this public image because look at me, I'm Madarame, I'm a great artist, but I also use people for my own gain and my artwork's actually not my own. And like a lot of his a, a lot of his his students were overworked and a lot of them were in really poor condition and a lot of them you know, I think a, a lot of them actually were, were starved, if I'm not mistaken. Like they weren't really like given like proper like like compensation, like drinks or food or money or anything. They like they didn't they didn't get anything. I don't remember if I saw any more of Madarame students, but I think it was implied. Uh, Nakanohara was uh, was um, the yes. shadow that led up to uh, Madarame's boss fight, and he was one of Madarame's former pupils. Ah, right. But yeah, Madarame just basically used other people to build himself up too, and he did it in a way that was just. That, that just overworked them, you know. They weren't they weren't properly compensated for their work. They weren't really given proper food or drink or nutrition. So a lot of them kind of fell sick. This is an example of Madarama being parasitic towards his own workers, where he takes his workers' work and 
ideas and innovations and essentially claims it as, a, as his own while he leaves his workers to get left behind, essentially. This is not only bringing up the idea of overwork at an a Asian country, but also how plagiarism mm -hmm. and works in getting away with it. But enough about that. Shall we move on to mm -hmm. Kaneshiro, guys? Uh, what do you guys think? What's yes. the next topic of discussion? So, I, Kaneshiro does feel like kind of... I mean, he, he's a he's a mafia, but he's a mafia boss. But yeah, no, yeah, he's, yeah he works on. with the mafia. He's a mafia boss. Yeah. Which I mean, it was a big. I'm certain was a big issue in Japan. So, but we, I don't have really the knowledge of that. Of course, there's the Yakuza games, but I do want to talk a little bit more about Futaba, mm -hmm. but not too not, not too long, but a little bit, um, because that is a real world issue. Even though Futaba is so cute. Probably too cute, though. There's people I've seen a drawing of Futaba that makes her slightly looks slightly less cute and maybe a little bit more realistic. But um, she's way too cute. But she is a representative. Even yes, she has a very specific reason for being a shut-in. But a lot of Japan is like Futaba. That's why all the why why she was yep. made was because a lot of Japan. Is yep, she's meant she's meant to be a representation of the of the hikikomori, which is a lifestyle that is actually very prominent in Japan, especially in. In, in the in, uh, in the otaku community, it's a very real, very big issue in Japan. Ikikomoris, they're just, they're shut-ins. As you know, with the increase of the internet, people talk more online rather than socializing mm -hmm. or even meeting with people outside. Yep. Does it exist also in South Korea or is it mainly Japan? Yeah. Not exactly. While you do find some forms of hikikomori also in South Korea, it's worse in Japan. South Korea has other problems Similar yep. problems, but I wouldn't say so, so the Hikikomori who are playing, is so the that people bad. Playing StarCraft bad. like you did, were not shut-ins. They just like to play StarCraft. There are a lot of StarCraft players, but that's because in South Korea, there's these things called PC rooms, where if people want to take a break, they can just go into the PC room and play games and chill. It's a lot more social because the computers aren't really divided that as much. You can stand up, go around, and talk with e with each other, but usually people there would just. Mm -hmm sit in front of their computers and play games. It's still a bit more social, I would say. Okay, well... Yeah, and with, with Hikikomori, Hikikomori, like, the, the translation of it, it, it like, from, from the Japanese translation, it means uh, pulling inward or being confined, and it's also known as acute social withdrawal, because it's a total withdrawal from society, and it's them taking extreme degrees of social isolation and confinement. And a lot of it has to do with psychological problems, and that's why Futaba... And that's why Futaba becomes a hikikomori, because she suffered such intense trauma and grief from her mother's death, that she's just afraid of everyone, and she's afraid of interacting with society, because she thinks everybody's just... Okay. laughing at her and that she's yeah everybody's out to get her because everybody did went out to get her at that young mm -hmm. age which made it's, her a gore exactly i was about she also, I was about she, to say she, that. she also exactly thought that she is. is kind of like a burden on people and that's a big reason why she didn't like interacting with people as well besides sojiro because sojiro was really the only person who made her feel like she wasn't a burden because she felt like a burden on All her right. mother because of the lies that the organization told her about her mother's death being a suicide because of her. Right. Yeah, but mm -hmm. here's the scoop. Futaba has underwent through severe trauma witnessing her mother's death at a very young age, and yeah, yeah. the fact that she's been blamed, she's been attacked by grown-ups who've been telling her it's her fault that Futaba's shutting herself in because of her past experiences with people who's who's been making her life hell. Because of this, she thinks everyone's out to get her, every, everyone's out to make her life miserable, so she has to protect herself by shutting herself in. She is agoraphobic because of this. This is what happens to a young person whose life has been screwed over, and doesn't have the energy or the willpower to talk to anybody anymore. Yes. Yes. Alright. Alright. Then how about I... Maybe I will talk a little bit about the Ajatra Sutra complex. Mm -hmm. Um... Just briefly. Yeah. So for the Ajatra Sutra complex, or just the Ajaze complex, I think it also applies to Futaba. Now, it is very much essentially a Japanese response to the Oedipus complex mm -hmm. for the mother. Mm -hmm. And in, of course, in Futaba's phallus, you just, you kill. And as she did in her, in her mind, like, basically kill her mother. I mean, because she thought she killed mm -hmm. her mother. So that's why in Japan, 
the mother is such more of a larger figure, and that's why it... But it also is the son to mother. Now, there is a thing called the Electra Complex, mm -hmm. but it includes such sexist terms, like sexist like I implications of what it is. It makes no yep. sense. So let's talk about the Achase Complex. And basically, in the story, I believe there there is this... I don't know if it is... Uh, there's Ajatra Sutra, who, who I believe has anger against his mother and tries to kill her. And that is like... Uh, as opposed to Oedipus, where he kills the father, um, she, he comes to kill the mother. So, in Japan, as Hawaii, and Hayao Kauai talks about this in his idea, that that the that the um, anger towards the towards like the rape of Nanking, like, that was like, there's a distinction between paternal and maternal energy, mm -hmm. and that's why also I think it goes into very well in Persona Four is the distinction between the anima and the animus. Mm -hmm. So the animus. Animus is the male aspect of a woman. The anima is the female aspect of the man. Um, so, yeah. So, there's that. So, for Futaba, of course, it's all around her mother, because the mother is a very important role in Japanese society. Mm -hmm. So now, back to overwork. Um, so, overwork. So, Madarame, yes, but hell god! It is a big issue... For Definitely. Okay. Yep. This one is yep. all about yep. workers being treated like robots, workers yep. being treated exactly. to perform monotonous tasks over time, and nothing more than a mindless mm -hmm. robot okay. doing yep. the same work over and over. No, yeah, that's literally how it was. You know, that's and I think that's how he treated his employees. He treated employees like robots. That's why the shadows in Okuma's palace are robots because he views his employees as nothing more than machines because. That's kind of how employees are viewed in Japan. They're just kind of viewed as machines that are meant to carry out their tasks. And that's why overworking is a huge issue in Japanese society, and that's why people unfortunately can die from exhaustion or from or from starvation and from overworking because then they might not be getting the proper amount of nutrition they need because they're working constantly on overtime and their hours are are completely messed up and causes them to have a messed up sleep schedule. An inconsistent eating schedule, it causes them to be fatigued, it might cause them to lose weight and just overall, you know, have very poor physical and mental health. And that's what Okumura was doing. He was he wasn't giving his his employees proper confidence compensation, he wasn't giving them breaks, he was making them constantly work overtime. He was treating them like they were just machines and just pawns that he could use to put at his expense to put his company on top. And that's why his deadly sin, of course, is great. Yep. So we didn't really go into deadly sins. If you want a, a little conversation on that, which is very short, I would check out the wisecrack discussion of Persona Five. Oh yeah, that, um, that goes a little bit. Yeah, into that, that video is great. It goes it goes into a lot of topic. It, it goes it goes into a lot of discussion about about the seven deadly sins and how each of the bosses represent their represent their sins in particular. Correct, but correct we're me not if I'm really wrong, talk about but didn't that, Okumura but also like, try to hook up his own daughter? With, with a creepy boyfriend or a creepy rich kid. Some rich kid wanted to take control of the company, including Haru. Uh, no. I, the, no, no, the, be, no, no, but there was a cognitive version of Haru's, um, uh, quote-unquote boyfriend, boyfriend Sugimura. Oh yeah, this yeah. freaking creep that no one really cares about. Oh, I hate him. Fiance. Fiance. Yeah, dude. Who has a who, who has a who, who has a really weird fetish for high school girls, and that's why he chooses to marry Haru because that's what his that's what his that's what his cognitive version says. I mean, it's disgusting. He this guy basically leeches onto Haru, and and clearly acts disgusting. Yeah. But he does this because he wants the power of her father's company. That's why he does these things. And yet her father thinks it's a good idea for her to for her and him to hook up. And yet, despite all of that, Haru still loves her father. There's still a part of her that makes her love Well, because I'm sure because back back when Haru was younger, obviously, there were still, there, there were a lot of, there, there were still positive experiences that she had with Okumura as a child. That's probably why she feels conflicted. But she sees how, she see how far, she sees how far her father is gone. And that's what steals up her resolve to, to find stand up again. They also him. tackle this quite well because Haru actually finds it easier to stand up to the fiance creep than her father because she knows the the fiance is just a disgusting creep like he knows 
they're bad. Like, it's easier to stand up to bad guys than it is your own family members because... And yeah, and K Caitlin brought up an, an excellent point where these are your parents. Like, these, this is the father that raised Haru from childbirth and actually had positive experiences. And it's hard to believe that how could someone so mm -hmm. great and loving and, and brought up and worked their way to bring me into this world could do something so heinous? How could you be the bad guy? It's, it's almost as if it's hard to believe. And the fact that Haru has to stand up to her own fa father like that, it's a million times more difficult than it is to standing up than a bad guy because and that and that's what Haru goes through and that's why mm -hmm. Haru has is is yeah. having a hard time and that's why she still loves her father because she can't ever forget nothing could ever replace ever replace the memories and positive memories she probably had as a childhood which is exactly why it's so difficult and and the resolve was is so slow mm -hmm. because she knows at some point she has to stop her father mm -hmm. yeah she realized and, that she, she, and I think the reason why Sugimura in particular was sort of the catalyst for it is because Sugimura didn't love Haru, no. really. He just saw her as like a means to an end to just sort of be married off to have a kid and be married off to the guy who owns like the biggest business conglomerate. You know, he just sort of basic. He 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 wants to marry. He he wants to marry Haru for the money and like. Oh no. He he used her. He didn't give a damn about Haru. Like he's he sexually like yeah. I I think he leeches onto Haru, and he always does this because he he wants to get close to Haru's father's money. Essentially, he he leeches onto Haru too. Like he's disgusting. Let me. Yeah, pretty much, and like it. Yeah, and 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 a big re and the, the the actual catalyst as to why Haru finally awakens in particular is because Okumura, like Shadow Okumura in particular, when Sugimura was when like the cognitive Sugimura was just like wanting to do really freaking awful things to her, he was just like, yeah, do whatever you want, I don't care, I don't care, <laughs> and it was at that moment that she realized, okay, and it was at that moment that Haru realized. Okay, dang, I guess you really don't view me as a human being. You just view me as another one of your puppets that you think you can control. All right, then. Uh, how about I say screw that and actually stand up against you and realize that you've kind of been a pretty big asshole for, my, for most of my teenage years. And also in general. Mm-hmm. Because she, I've been trying because she knows what her father... She, she knows what Okumura is doing is wrong. She clearly sees it, and she wants to try and change. She wants to try and change, change her father's heart. But she's, but but she's she's still afraid because it's her father. She's afraid to face that confrontation. Let me ask a question this way: Like, let's say if you had a family member just like Okumura, let's say you had a father or a mother running some sort of business conglomerate, and you, and you probably had like positive relations with with your family members, of course, mm -hmm. and. If, and you realize what they're doing is wrong, you wouldn't think about standing up to them for the first time. You would probably stand up to them in a different path, like, hey, let's talk this way out of it. Hey, I'd rather talk this way by saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong, why not do this one? You wouldn't be on the offense immediately. You would try and, and like, yeah, you would try I about it in a, talk or? You would try to go about it in a more passive way rather than taking a more aggressive approach. Exactly. That's exactly what Haru's doing to her father, and that's why Haru is passive initially because she doesn't want to like battle her father. She wants to talk it out and prevent anything from getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I guess the thing is, I sort of Haru was raised in a very different way than I was. I, I believe Haru was raised in a in a very like polite, like do what you have to weigh, like. But she was still was one hundred percent. I mean, had the life of luxury. Like, you see her room. Oh, yeah, it's, 100%. You see the stuff she wears. The stuff she wears, especially the freaking outfit she wears. Okay, it's still not too over the top, but, like, the, the outfit she wears in Strikers is so... It's very nice. Like, she's... she's a, Haru is far more polite, and she knows her manners well. She probably took etiquette classes. 
as yeah. part of her tutoring and living in that same shelter. Yeah, on life. top of that, she that's supposed yeah, she, to be she, her just, she lived a very sheltered life. That's just how it was. Again, but, it's tough because her father's the one that set up her lifestyle. But she could, I mean, if she stood up to her father, there's the fear of being, you know, disowned and being taken off all that mm -hmm. money. I can, I can say I can relate to that. Um, I don't know, again, again, she was raised very separ separate from mm -hmm. me, but, like, there, if you, and I'm lucky, like, again, to not, again, they, they let, they let me do what I want, but, like, because her life Not was, only for there's a god complex, exactly but shows that like, Shido and his lackeys so, like, all were a part of a mm -hmm. yellow bale cult have the, all have along. Freedom. That sounds like but another that character. That also fits back into, <laughs> that, Makoto and, and, but, again, we're talking about Japan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, again, your, your life being, that's, that's Japan. So, but I want, but we, we're, we're, I don't want to go for too long, mm -hmm. because we have we still have me me freaking talking about Gnosis, um, fan talking about Gnosticism and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. But first, we got to talk a little bit, and it seems like it's gonna be a little bit about Japanese politics, because none of us are too knowledgeable about it. But what from what but from what we do know, Japan is a very freaking conservative country, as we have shown. And Shido is 100% a representative of the, it's called the Future Party, but it's the Liberal Democratic Party. And he is a, he is a, um, telling of Shinzo yeah, Despite, Abe. despite having um, Liberal Democratic in the name, they're not very liberal and they're not very left-wing. In fact, it's actually one of the more right-wing parties. It's like, actually, it's center, it's center-right to right-wing in terms of its politics. Yeah. So Shinzo Abe, so, no, yeah, okay. I'm now calling Shido Shinzo Abe, but <laughs> the Shido the never acted. Shido doesn't ever actually say a policy outside of apparently trying to turn Japan into a dictatorship, mm -hmm. which it could have already basically, you know what, it kind of, if that is the case if they say that in the game, it basically is because the Conservative Party has held, again, Japan for 21 years. Mm -hmm. And apparently, like, each, each of the, each, each of the freaking, um, Prime Ministers outside Shinzo Abe didn't last very long because they all had, apparently had issues. And Shinzo Abe, nonetheless, had bribery scandals mm -hmm. and other stuff. Yeah, he, so he apparently had Shido, bribery scandals, he had favoritism scandals. Yeah, I can definitely see the connections, because, you know, like, people may have good ideas and good intentions with their policies, but their methods and- but, but their methods and how they go about it is what makes somebody a good prime minister or a good president or a good governor of a country. And unfortunately, Shido, not exactly the best governor. <laughs> He isn't actually the prime minister yet. He's the candidate, yeah, yeah. correct? He's yeah, he is a candidate. Yes. But he was a heavily favored candidate. I thought he already actually did. At least we saw him and he actually did win already. I believe so. I think it was just for his re-election. I'm also not quite sure, but they did mention that Shido was winning by a lot in the games. And Shido has managed to get very far. So at this point, we can probably say he is winning. Or if he'd lost in the first round, he probably had enough votes to win in the second round. Either way, either way, Shido clearly is, if he's, a, I mean, I, I'm guessing, the, again, since we are talking about parliament, he, he probably had still some position in in, 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 in government. Yeah, no, yeah, so. he, he was a politician. I think he was a cabinet minister. Okay. Yep. And because he was such and... a beloved cabinet minister, and because of his his charismatic, and, and because of his naturally charismatic nature, it was so easy for him to climb up that ladder. Yeah, I thought, so Shido is very charismatic. I figured and he would use whatever tools necessary to get his way to the top. We, you do have to note that Shido's charismatic behavior is what's going to get him to the top. It's what's going to get him to that position so that he's on his way and he's winning by a landslide. The thing is, in Cheeto's palace, so as it talks about in, in the in this article that you in, from a U.S. gamer that we are we've been referencing basically for the Japanese issues section, I, not Hikikomori, but 
like bullying, overwork, and Cheeto are from this art from an article called "The Real World Issues" by uh, behind Persona Five. All y'all should read it. It's great. So that's what we're referencing. Mm -hmm. So for in Cheeto's Palace, I mean, I know I know you did, Caitlin. Um, I think you did your magic, but I'm talking I'm talking about to our wonderful audience. But towards um, in apparently in Cheeto's barge of Greek, um, a barge of pride or something, whatever it is. But it is his sin is yes. pride, as you can see. His sin oh, yeah. is pride. I mean, he because has a savior complex. It's pretty obvious he has. It's pretty obvious that his sin is pride. I, he literally says I was chosen, but chosen by God. He yep. says that himself. But the God that chose him. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the God who chose him. We'll talk in about Yelda in a minute. We'll get. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you. But it's the false God. Now, for briefly, um, Shido in that in in that in in the barge of pride or whatever it is. Um, an arc to basically to go over all Japan. That's how little shits he gives about his people. Lit zero shits. Yep. Um, he there is a poster that apparently is very an ominous version of a 2015 poster from Shinzo Abe, which and he says the same thing. We'll take our country back. Now, I'm just gonna say you know, I don't care. We're gonna say these are also very similarities to Donald Trump. To to I guess the way people think about Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and he basically says make Japan great again. Likely, most likely, a coincidence because when the game was first made, the first the game came out in 2016, 2017, right? Yes. And yes, it came out. It came out in late 2016 in Japan, but it came out in 2017 in in the West. So very much coincidence. You can and but here's the thing: Shinzo Abe, Donald Trump, great relationship. So they're not wrong. <laughs> Yeah, they oh, did yeah. have a very good relationship with each other because they were both nationalists. <laughs> though, 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 though Trump, though Trump had an issue of calling Shinzo Abe while he was asleep because he un didn't understand time differences. So of yeah. But you, but. <laughs> yes, that was it. I remember that. So. But basically, Shido, um, asshole, <laughs> um, asshole, and is the one pulling the strings. Um, Ake Buse Akechi, freaking yeah, he read a clearly. He basically manipulated his own son to commit murders and planned to kill his own son also, after he was done. And also yeah, shamed his own child's mother because, uh oh, I had an affair with this woman, and she, uh, uh, I had a child out of wedlock. Let's shame this woman publicly until she ends up committing suicide and then have this kid passed around a bunch of foster homes and not bother to raise him because, oh no, I don't care about him. He's not as great as me. I'm Shido. <laughs> yep, but here's the, here's the problem. Shido is, Shido, even though he has the, his, his, apparently according, according to Into the Wisecrack video, his, his shadow is not, um, Lucifer, which is which is the no, yeah, it's of, it's of, it's of it's Samuel. It Samuel, is Samuel, yeah. yes. Samuel, which is what, which is another, which is another name for Yadavea. <laughs> oh, so, of course. So uh, yeah, which specifically, even filters the god complex. Means, yes. Yeah, uh, Shido and his lackeys were worship were trying to bring Yadavea's vision to light. But also, what's even funnier is that Yaldabaoth was the one that chose Shido to do his bidding. For having a messiah or god complex, Shido is right that on the fact that God chose him to do his own bidding. He was the yes, cult leader. and um, he was the cult leader. And oh right, before we go to Yaldabaoth, I get to have a quick word about our boy Freud. Even though he's sexist and weirdo, uh, we're gonna talk about our nice Jewish um, by blood guy. So, um, because you was not Jewish, but Fred was, and I'm Jewish, so, yay. Um, but yeah, briefly again, finally, with, with Shido, um, what was I gonna Shido say? Bad. But, yeah, oh, he's, no, he's bad, bad person! Um, Shido yeah, Bad! So, but, you know, what's a, it's a bad person. Shido Bad! <laughs> Pretty much. Yes, but here's the thing, here's the thing, to, to have a cult, you need to have members of that cult, and that's where Freud comes in. Exactly. That's where Freud comes in. Because, oh yes, we're gonna. Oh yes, the section I about Cheeto and, and how it, and how he ties into Freud psychology. Very very short, but basically Freud went against the idea of herd instinct, of the of just simply as because he wanted it to very in his book Group Psychology and Analysis of the Ego, which I read for Psychology Religion. Yep. He 
talks he, he talks about the idea about the charismatic leader, which of course Stalin, Hitler, and Shido. Um, so the charismatic leader, of course. So when Shido supposedly has a change of heart, his people keep on cheering him on. That's because he was so charismatic that the people had to go behind him. So, and that's why it's hard to sway them. It's just a very small thing, but. <laughs> I didn't go. I look back, really match back in it, but basically, charismatic leader that the herd needs its leader, and Shido is that leader. And also, the thing I remembered, they're talking about just again how about the empty platitudes of politicians, like how easy it's to get by in Japan without actually having any substance. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Even after Shido confessed every crime he's done, the people still worship him and, and love him and still look up to him as if the same thing how a person looks up to a cult leader. So, that's that. Now, the god that Cheeto is working with, and that is Yalda Bayout. I finally get to talk about or, or as my so. friend Tim likes to call him, Yaldi Baldi. <laughs> Yaldi <Yaldi-baldi>. Baldi! <laughs> Spoilers, Yalda Bayout was... Yaldi Baldi was secretly also Igor. The Igor of this game was secretly, was secretly Yalda mm-hmm. Bayout. Perfect, because Yaldi, <laughs> Yaldi Baldi was secretly Yaldi Baldi, who is the great deceiver. Who's a great deceit? Yaldi Baldi! Yeah, Yaldi. exactly. Yaldi Baldi. Baldi. So, Yaldi Baldi was um, basically in Gnosticism, which, in fact, Jung loves Gnosticism in Spiritual Problem of the Modern Individual. Go figure. He loves it. He says it's great. He says it, things like Theosophy and Anthroposophy and Christian Science, like all that stuff, it's great. But problem is, Gnosticism is very anti-Semitic, which, I, which is bad. But if you forget the anti-Semitism, it's a great, it's Yaldi, Yaldi, Yaldi Demiurge, Samael, Saklos is a great villain for any story. Because it's basically the, the, the society that has been created, which is for Japan and in general, our mod, the, the, you could just say the modern dogmas of society. Yep. The cynicism, the stagnation, and the Yaldi Bayo, and there's so much good stuff, but I'm going to try to squeeze it. Basically, in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, his autobiography, he talks about how he had so much more of a closer attachment to God. He didn't see... His father was a priest, but he saw God in a different way than he did. He didn't... He actually had a fear of Jesus. So, like, he had a fear of, of Jesus and the people in the black coats, which were um, the Jesuits mm-hmm. in, 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 in Switzerland. So, basically, with that idea... When Jung was asked, do you believe in God? He said, I don't believe. I know. That and that basically is that there's a much more personal God. And that personal, go- personal God is, of course, the persona. Which are figures from mythology. Now, of course, you don't worship. It's not like the persona is a God. But the fact is, these are figures that relate to the, to the creative works of the creative and collective and co- unconscious. That's why... Yusuke sees mementos as, as 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 an image of beauty to be studied. That's why Yusuke joins, because of the beauty that you can find in the story. The beauty that has been lost in our society. And for that reason, Yaldabaoth basically is... Um, so Yaldabaoth is actually... Why is it anti-Semitic? Because it is actually the god of the Old Testament. It is the Jewish god. Which is bad. But forget that. It, it, so it basically is the god of the material world. There's another god outside of that that you that is apparently the Christian god according to the Gnostics that you can pray to. Why the why the Yaldabao, why Demiurge is such a tyrant, um, and asks for me me me. Well, well we got the chill hippie Christian god. So basically, Yaldabao symbolizes by this by why is he could now of course. My religious studies teacher has, has, has urged me, again, to, to say, I mean, he doesn't urge me to say this, but gods cannot die, especially in the Christian complex. So, really, Yadaveot, even a false god, so Yadaveo in, in Gnosticism cannot die. But because, again, he's, a, he's an image I mean, of, he's really Shido a creation and his lackeys of, a, all yeah. were a part of trying to follow Yadaveot's plan at, at the end of the game. And also, yeah, not, not to mention Shido giving birth to Akechi, and Shido and Akechi really hating each other for what happened to Akechi's Totally, heart. I can keep up. I can. I, I'm perfectly fine. Yaldabaoth. 
is you could say is a monster, but is the is the creation of the un of the unconscious. He rules the unconscious, which is a prison. Finally, get to talk about that too. Yaldabaoth is the ruler of the prison of regression. Now, in yep. um, in any way, but especially in um, Freud, it as is is a way is a mech is a mechanism of when you repress. Mm -hmm. So a way to repress is to go younger, and in prison of repression is a prison where the people don't want to leave, and that's why after the shadows are defeated, they return to the prison of regression. Mm -hmm. And why and why and that prison, of course works for all of the, all of society everywhere but why it works so well for japan is because of the exclusivity of of how much you are forced to be the way you are <laughs> and that's why in games like guilty gear and like people any japanese games that love that rock shit and why english is to force ourselves away from that but does that mean to completely go away from west East, eastern society and go to west no again it's a synthesis it's a new way forward <laughs> because of course jung would say the west sucks let's go to the east east some people say east sucks let's go to the west so let's just put them together yeah. it's like the merging well, of the I, two so, into one it's like you pick the best and that's why you got personas from all from all mythologies from all places yeah you take the, the yeah you take the best aspects of different parts of society and merge them together and you got the phantom piece that's right um you got the sea squad you got the Troop squad, whatever. They're uh, they're called the investigation <laughs> team in Persona 4. The investigator, the investigation team, and the people from one and two. Like you got, you got the best aspects of the society put together. Yep. Um, and then that's why they're referred to. That's why they're delinquents. So basically, killing Yaldabaoth, destroying Yaldabaoth, is freeing society from conformity, from the modernity that has been gone by science. Of course, you wants to go back to tradition. You wants to go back to tradition, but. That's so. That's why, and you wants us to go towards things like Buddhism, and there's again a lot about why we should be listening to Buddhism. But we gotta merge everything together, mm -hmm. and that is Yalda Bayo. So I can keep. I'm gonna keep on talking until magic comes yeah, back, go ahead. So, and I'd be really happy to keep on talking. Keep on talking about magic. Okay, so Yalda Bayo. So, um, yo, oh, here's an interesting little mm -hmm. thing. Um, um, Joker's ultimate persona is called Satanaya. Yes, it is. And that, my, that Professor Cooper, Stephen Cooper, my good friend, said that I.L., like Nathaniel, is actually a um, means of God. So Satan, it's actually Satan of God. So secretly, Jung was right all along, it's the true God coming in who is viewed as the devil. Because in this world, the roles have been reversed. The heroes are the villains, the villains are the heroes. And that's why, that's why we have, um, and, that, and that's why Satan I.L., it's not actually Satan, it is the Satan of God. Oh, wow. And the Satan of God. Which basically actually is the Jewish Satan, because in, Ju in Judaism, Satan never falls. He's just he's just the angel of death and just does and just tempts people because God told him to. Christianity is like, nah, we need a villain. We need a, we need we, we need Satan to be evil so we can explain evil in a different way. Because God can't create evil himself. Other people have to. And then no! Not is like, no, not even Satan can't even create evil. God from the Old Testament created evil. <laughs> so, God from the Old Testament created evil. Um, and he's got a bunch of things. And, um, yeah. So, do you want to talk a little bit? I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about East versus West? That's what's been on my mind so much. Let's talk about it. You can, yeah, you about can East start versus... it off. No, oh. no, no, you tell me. I, I've basically been talking about East versus West. Oh, what, you what do I think? Do I think at all? <laughs> um, uh, if you don't think at all, I can just keep on going. You, you can keep on going. If I, if I have something, I'll try to barge in when I can. Okay. Basically, um, Yadabeo, um is, again, what is, so Freud, Jung, basically guys, we need a lot more Jung. The fact is, again, Jung himself, has been ostracized in psychology. Psycho and if Hidden Spring is correct and the unconscious might it somehow be real, obviously there's not actually a cognitive world where we can all slip into to either stop people from dying, change people's hearts, the good good people's hearts or change reality people's hearts, or both. I mean, because you can also change people's hearts. So. Mm -hmm. But, um, or, or, or the stuff that happens in Priest Persona 5 Strikers. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I love the philosophy. Okay, I guess I get to talk about- I guess we're gonna talk a little bit about what- like, I guess I'll start by talking about why Persona 5 means so much to me. Yeah. 
Persona 5 means so much to me exactly because of Yalda Bale. Because it's what way do you want to? What is the new direction you want the world? <laughs> and Jung, if you look into his work, really look into Jung. I put out some good quotes on the Twitter and the Facebook. Jung really saw so many things. And um, his philosophy is really a nice, honestly, Western adaptation of Buddhism. <laughs> it really kind of is. Even though it's full of just Asian... It's just so interesting. And it, it, will, it will seriously, like, if you watch Persona 5, it will... It, it, especially Persona 4, but my best friend in Persona 5 helped him. Um... Um, Persona 5 helped him, and because it, re it made him realize that maybe he sees like how, how, like your problems are not are normal, especially for Japan. Your problems are normal. Everyone's dealing with this. <laughs> now, is it a little pessimistic about Japan as a girl? Yes, but free yourself and unlock your persona, and you will and you will deal with your mental issues. Okay, Caitlin, why does Persona 5 mean so much to you? <laughs> Obviously, Persona 4 means more, but why is Persona 4? Well, means Persona more? 5 still means a great deal to me. I think one of the reasons why I love Persona 5 so much is because of the fact that it just tells you to be yourself, and it pushes a very positive mes message of being your own voice for change, you know, standing up for what you believe in, fighting for what you believe in, and never, you know, going back on your passions, and a lot of the confidants. Especially in regards to two of my favorite confidants are Ryuji's and Yusuke's. Just because it's about them figuring out what they really want to do. You know, with Yusuke, it's about what is true art. What type of art does he want to make? How does he want to express himself in a way that he thinks he thinks is is the is the best possible way to bring out his potential. But with Ryuji, it's also it's a matter of what am I going to do now, you know? I can't exactly have a scholarship anymore for athletics because, well, I have a permanent injury that causes me to be unable to run for long periods of time and I can't I can't support my mother anymore, so what am I going to do now? And because of, you know, because of because of him spending time with Joker, he finds out that, you know, he, he finds out what he wants to do. He wants to buckle down and he wants to get to work and studying and find something else that you know he could be good at and he still wants to continue with exercise he just can't he just can't go into a track scholarship but he still wants to pursue athletics as a career because that's something he's always been passionate about and i think just watching these kids just form such a tight bond together and just grow closer as people and figuring out what they want to do and going through the motions of adulthood it it's just so touching and it's so fun and even if i have my problems with the game like in, in particular, how in the base Persona 5 game, how they treated a lot of how they treated a lot of the gay characters as being predatory. I didn't really find that very very nice, but that's just because Japan has very has very warped views on homosexuality and the LGBTQ plus community as a whole, which is a whole can of worms that we're gonna have to go into probably never. <laughs> but. Um, Unless the game, unless there's a game that exposes mm -hmm. that, but let's, like, maybe Persona 6, they'll learn their ways. Maybe. Never maybe Persona 5 Strikers, we'll, we'll see as I keep on playing. Maybe maybe they'll be better with that. Maybe, maybe. But, but... Maybe Persona 6. <laughs> but yeah, that's why it means so much to me. It's just a fun, beautifully stylized game with fun characters and a really good message, and from from learning more about Jungian psychology and learning more and, and looking at it through the lens of, of, of Jungian philosophy and psychology, it's put a lot of more things into perspective that, yeah, it, it has a lot, it has a lot to talk about, it has a lot to say about, about Japanese society and how that can also extend to all different aspects of society throughout the world. It's a game that has a, that has not just an effect in Japan, but it has an effect on a global scale. And that's, that's what it means to me. What does it mean to you, Magic? To me, I mean, I could talk about a whole bunch of reasons why I like Persona 4, and Persona 4 will always be my favorite game. Persona 5 is a game that does stand out to me because uh, the theme of Persona 5, or just Persona games in general, is you have your life, this is how you live, how are you going to spend your time? 
you have all this time, but it's also limited. Like, you're eating away at it every single second, at every single day. Use it wisely and take your time. And to me, Persona 5, yeah, sure, there's a lot of topics on union psychology, standing up to, like, injustices, like, spending time with their confidants, but it's always been about how to live life the way you, you see it. And just because just because you the universe gave you a wrong a wrong hand of cards to deal with or or maybe you've come across a couple of screwed up moments in your life where you've had a couple bad days that doesn't mean you should give up right away at least understand that persona 5 is about growing up whether it's being an adult or a teenager it's still about growing up from where you started off and trying to make the best of whatever time you have. It may not be a lot of time, but that that's still no reason to try to make it as worth as the time as you spent with your friends, your family, the people that you work with, your coworkers, your boss, doesn't matter. You you spend time with them because they make up your life essentially. And so I guess if I had to, to share one thing about one of the characters with Ryuji, Ryuji is one of those characters where he lost all meaning in his life. Where, yeah, like he, he suffered an injury where he couldn't go on the track team anymore. And he, and he was depressed because how am I going to support my family? What am I going to do with my life? Or what's going to be, what's, what's going to be ahead of me in my future? And Ryuji's not alone. That's like a lot of people who think they've lost meaning in their lives just because of one bad day or or people have moved on without them, or the idea that that I, I'm now left behind because I'm not needed anymore. But that doesn't mean you should just stagnate and give up. You still have the time to figure out what it is you enjoy and keep at it. Just because one possible career path or one chapter in your life has ended doesn't mean the whole book has ended. You still keep on going with the time you have. Time is neutral. Time, it's not fickle. It's not even taking sides to one point to another. It's not even linear structured the way we'd think that it would. It's just a weird duration of what you do with it and how I'm going to use it to make my life. And that's pretty much how I see the Persona games is that I'm going to do something creative with it. I'd like to say this about the Persona games. They're the anti-Chosen One stories. Like, you know how the Chosen One story is like, oh, you're the sacred hero that will save us. Persona... I don't know if Persona does that or not. Exactly. And I feel like... I mean, for for Persona 4, you got Persona Retro Yourself. Uh, openings, like, 3 is Burn My Dread. Yes. Um, which is all about... about all, all about... Oh yeah, I could talk about that too. Wake up, get up, get out there. Mm-hmm. And you can change it, and that and that and that you as an individual, obviously not through as radical means as going into people's mm-hmm. minds, or uh, and 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 freaking changing the heart. But like, you can still be a voice through. for change. I think, I think that's that's a really good positive message that Persona Five was trying to part onto people is that anyone can do it. Anyone can make change in the world. You just, Especially Ryu. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, do you know I'm a phantom thief? Not I mean really. the Joker. I mean Joker still has be- has things handed because because you're a protagonist. But all the other characters, no, no, not really. I mean, still, I mean they. I, I mean they're. I wouldn't really say that. Why is Joker I the wild card? Really chosen. Why is he the wild? Card? Well, I mean he was. Well, I mean, well, I mean the wild. Well, I mean the wild card thing. It sort of has chosen one aspect to it because look at you. You are the one who has the ability. You're the only one who has the ability out of the entire cast to wield multiple personas. That makes you special. Yeah.
But is Joker technically getting more? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think also briefly, um, uh, yeah, no, actually, uh, what I want to say, yeah, that's, actually, no, I'm, I'm not going to go on that, but yeah, again, like, wake up, get up, get out yes. there. You're stronger. It's all about, oh, I know, yeah, you can be a voice, exactly, you can be a voice to change. Stuff like Ryuji will not make you weak. Like, you can find a voice, and thing is, Japan actually has, um, had a strong protest group, especially against bringing back the military, mm -hmm. which Takeshi um, Umehara, who is, I think, we might bring up um, Takeshi Umehara in our Kami discussion, um, because he is a big Japanese philosopher, a uh, modern one, mm -hmm. and he's he was very much against bringing back the military. Now, the military is not brought up at all in this game, but as, that was a thing that a giant protest movement was about. And of course, a lot of that went through social media. Now, I think I don't. We don't need to go with it. Obviously, social media is a big thing, and the children are very big parts of that. So, in general, though, for Persona 5, it just touches me so much because it feels like you can unlock any anyone really can anyone can do it. Yes, it's a little bit too much of like these are the special people. These are the only guys that really know how to do it. But yes, obviously, in real life, it takes a lot more people than just the Phantom Thieves. It takes a whole group of students, just like the ones that protested um, against against the Military Authorization Act, just like the people who are protesting against, like for for all the issues, for all the issues that you want. Mm -hmm. It takes a, it takes a village. But still, the fact that they talk about your voice for change and you can make a difference for me is very important. And that, I think we will end there. Everyone. This has been a great episode of our first episode of season two of of Philosophy. I was gonna say <laughs> Philosophy. That's my. That's the other thing I do. Um, but yeah, Philosophy. We're gonna be on season four for that. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, Philosophy. And see you next time for our N episode. Ah yes, why N adds up? Um, I do have some final words. Thank you so much for having me on this. This has been a really fun experience. Um, I may have... Yeah, I may have fumbled a little bit, but that's just because I'm not really too good at being put on the spot yet, but I am looking forward to improving my discussion skills through this. I am looking forward to improving... Uh, to, to sort of expanding my philosophical knowledge and looking more into this. This is a great start to my year in 2021 this is gonna be so much fun and i'm super grateful to have the opportunity and i hope you guys i hope you guys will continue to enjoy what we have to offer here and i hope i can bring content that makes you guys happy too and stick out for caitlin's discussion of top 10 fire emblem three houses characters yeah, now we, of course we did a discussion of fire emblem three houses and yeah, stick out for Fire Emblem Three Houses characters. Stick out for me, Magic, and Alana um, talking about Okami. And that is where we will stop for now. There's many other things I have in mind, but those three things you should keep you juicy. Mm -hmm. um, and well, we can't forget about Magic's final. I'm words. so happy we're back. Yes, Magic's final. I just want to say thank you guys for having me here. So glad to bring up some points and talk more about more into P5 and what else other topics we can delve into i'm i'm so glad to oh, chat yeah. with you guys and i hope i can come back for more well thank you for listening we're gonna do it again we're gonna do it yeah well i'm looking so forward to it royal probably well we're probably gonna be talking about persona uh, something else persona together um so yeah yeah i think our next persona okay everyone might be strikers but all but but uh i want to plan something to it try and maybe three. delve into persona 3. i'll have to revisit persona 3 at some point and we'll have to make notes on it and have a discussion about that but we'll definitely be putting more persona content there will definitely be more episodes with the three of us so if you so if you like having us three as a dynamic together look forward to that because we'll probably find some other things that we could talk about together exactly and again Every game, no story untold. This has been David Leibowitz, Magic, and Caitlin, and peace out. Peace out.